everybody, thank you so much for coming on a gorgeous uh, spring day. This is the best day this year, I have to say. It's gorgeous, gorgeous weather. And I'm just so glad all of you came out to meet Uchira, who I am happy to say has been a friend of mine for... 30 years? No, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. Before, like, an indeterminate <laughs> <laughs> um, We met in the uh, 1990s at some point where a mutual friend kept saying, oh, you have to meet Uchira, she's amazing, you love her, you have to meet Uchira. And I was like, yeah, everyone's always trying to introduce you people. But in this case, I was so glad that we met. And at around the time that we really got to know one another, I was living in Delhi and working as a reporter, and Uchira was working as a reporter too. And on one of her stories, she went up to Nepal, which she visited a lot as a, as a kid. Her family, which is from Forbesganj, uh, which is in the state of Bihar, near uh, the border with Nepal. And she was she, her family has connections with the democratic movement in Nepal, as well as uh, in India and in Nepal. They had to struggle to to get their rights. Um, even today, but, um, and, but in any event, so she was on a reporting trip to Nepal, she's in this village that's off the road where people have nothing, uh, not even TV sets, maybe a bicycle in the whole village, and there were no girls. And she'll tell you about it, there are no girls, no women, and she said, you know, where, where are the girls, where are the young women? And they said, oh, you know, they've gone off to Bombay. And she's like, well, how do you get from this tiny village all the way to, to Bombay? you know, in a village that has nothing. And it, the answer, it turns out, is that you are coerced or taken against your will or sold. And it's there that she began to discover the, the issue of trafficking and really uh, has put it on the map, uh, both in India and in this country. Uh, first with a film called The Selling of Innocence, for which she won an Emmy. Uh, and then she went on uh, leaving journalism and founded an organization that works to sort of empower girls and women so that they can sort of break out of this cycle that they, in which they feel that prostitution is their destiny and begin to take control over their lives. This would require changing laws, fighting police, and all sorts of things, which Wuchira can tell you about. This book is uh, sort of first, it was published in India, and it's a collection of stories uh, that talk about, you know, a subject that isn't talked about in many cultures, and certainly not in India. It talks about, you know, from the uh, about women who are uh, who have been prostituted uh, for, you know, and there, and it's historical. Some of the stories around the time of partition, some are modern, some are older, and it sort of opens up this whole area about prostitution and the status of women that um, is depressing reading, <laughs> hard to read, but I think needs to be told because we don't really know what forces uh, women and families to take these desperate steps. But to uplift, Wuchira is somebody who's going, who's really working to sort of break out of that and has helped rescue tens of thousands of girls and women from, from this situation. Hi, come in. Please just come in. Great to see Hi you. Hi there. Good to see you too. Hi. Christine, there's a seat just here and help yourself to a drink. I just introduced Richard. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, it's just wonderful to be doing this in Susie's home. Uh, you know, we've traveled a long journey together and always uh, you know, talking about issues of justice, fairness, and uh, equality, equity, many things. Uh, you know, in the long uh, period that we've known each other in India, when she was posted to Israel, and then uh, Washington, D.C., the issues we covered. So it's really um, just such a joy to be sitting in our home and discussing my, my book. Um, it's a collection of 21 stories on uh, prostitution written by modern Indian writers. And the uniqueness of this collection is it's around one team spanning a period of 70 years uh, of India's history. And it is translated from 12 different languages. And these languages are still spoken among other languages in India. So it's from the length and breadth of what is now our subcontinent, because then part of some of the writers ended up in Pakistan. And they didn't know each other. They um, didn't even know that they were writing similarly about the same issues. But they were all enthralled by the idea of Quality, influenced by India's freedom struggle from British colonialism. Some stories are written before partition and some are written after partition of India. India became India and Pakistan and Bangladesh over the years. But all of them have one thing in common, this empathy. Uh, 
uh, these writers, many of them are men, but uh, in some of the stories, they can actually see things from the point of view of the woman, the prostituted woman. And uh, for example, there's one story which uh, the book is named after River of Flesh, in which uh, the writer actually talks about, uh, you know, this female character talks about the fact that she can't stand the smelly feet of her customers. Now that's an occupational hazard which uh, you know most of us couldn't even imagine, let alone uh, you know write about it. And here's this man who writes about this. Um, uh, there's another writer who writes about uh, you know the fact that uh, you know she she is a, again uh, she's a living writer now. Um, her name is Manisha Kulshreesh, and she writes about a son with empathy who doesn't like the fact that his mother is a nude model. And the mother understands that uh, thing about her son, that anger in her son. Or the first story is called A Doll for the Child Prostitute, and it's about this uh, little uh, child who's sold into a brothel by her mother because the mother cannot protect her from a stepfather who's raping her. And uh, you know, she keeps asking for a doll from this inspector, this uh, corrupt police officer who comes to buy her, who's like 50 or 60 years old. And he does buy her the doll. And then she's playing with the doll and pushing the tummy of the doll and the doll is saying mummy, mummy. And he sees her playing with the doll and this transformation inside the man because he says that he doesn't want to have sex with her anymore. He's, he tells the brothel owner when he's walking away that I can't do this anymore. So these stories are also about empathy, bridging uh, you know, things between men and women, between the rich and the poor, uh, and showing, showing the brutality of prostitution in spite of it all in its... Uh, starkest form. And the reason I did this book actually is, as uh, Susie mentioned, that my own journey into this uh, dark world, uh, this dark space uh, in which I'm trying to find light constantly began uh, about 20 years ago, maybe 20, 21 years ago. And I was walking through the hills of Nepal uh, when I came across uh, rows of villages uh, which didn't have any girls from 15 to 45. And I began to ask the men in those villages where the girls were, they were drinking tea, playing cards, um, some giggled, some were hostile, but a few answered, they all were in Bombay. And I couldn't understand how, you know, like they could be in Bombay. These villages were even two hours away from the highway. Bombay was 1400 kilometers away. And I began to investigate like a good journalist. I began to look for the answer to that question that how could these girls reach Bombay and the answer changed my life. Because what I found was that there was a smooth supply chain from the villages to the brothels of Bombay with a local village procurer who could be an uncle, a neighbor, a brother offering poor starving farmers $50, $100 and saying that he would get his uh, daughter a job in the big city, get her married, sometimes even say prostitution and say, but you know, prostitution will give her food, will give her uh, a place to stay, she'll send some money back home. And the farmers were so ignorant, they would let their daughters go. And uh, then the whole you know, process of enslavement began because this procurer would then take her to the big cities of Kathmandu and Viratnagar, cluster together two or three girls, hand her over to another set of transporters who would take her to the border of India and Nepal there, there were the Karak border guards, uh, wink, wink, nod, nod, and the girls were taken across the border. On the other side were these lodge keepers. Now by lodges, I mean really shabby places with plastic sheets and corrugated cement sheets, where these girls were locked up for two or three days and raped by, uh, you know, beaten, starved, um, drugged, and their spirits were completely subjugated. And then they were handed over to another set of transporters who put them in trucks and trains and other, you know, buses and took them to the brothels of Bombay and Delhi and Calcutta. And then there were the pimps who would negotiate the price of these girls depending on their beauty. Now by beauty, I mean fair skin was at a premium, uh, being voluptuous was at a premium, docile premium, and the younger the better. The youngest I have met is a seven year old. And the average age of a girl being pulled into prostitution in India is between 9 and 13. In the United States, it's between 13 and 15. So not that different. And uh, then these girls were handed over to these brothel managers who would just lock them up for the next five years in small rooms with iron bars on the window. And uh, they were raped by eight or 10 customers every night. 
and for the first time she would uh, fetch for the brothel manager maybe as much as 15,000 rupees or you know maybe 200, 300 dollars but uh, after that it was 30 cents per lay and uh, this, you know she would be used up completely consumed and then spit out she would be thrown on the street when she was no longer commercially viable, told that now you can't attract customers, you're a burden on the brothel and left on the streets to die with diseases, maybe a couple of children. And behind the brothel manager were the landlords, behind the landlords were uh, the money lenders or the financiers and behind them the organized criminal networks. So I saw this and I ended up making a documentary. Uh, called The Selling of Innocence uh, on it with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation and uh, went on to win an Emmy for Outstanding Investigative Journalism exactly 20 years ago in September. And uh, I was in the Broadway Marquis Hotel in New York and it all felt very irrelevant. I was getting great job offers but somehow I felt that this is not what I want to do. Maybe it was a calling, uh, you know, maybe it was just outrage being female, being Indian, that it was happen in my country, my generation, my lifetime. As a journalist, I covered war and famine and hunger and uh, even ethnic and caste conflict. But I've never seen this kind of deliberate exploitation of one human being by another. So I, uh, you know, did take any of those job offers and started badgering the people I met that night to say that let me do something on prostitution, on sex trafficking. That time I didn't even know to call it sex trafficking. I didn't even know it was trafficking. And I just knew it was the deepest exploitation I'd ever seen in my life. And uh, so I, um, the UN uh, gave me a consultancy to go up to Southeast Asia to see how women in prostitution were combating AIDS. AIDS was also something newly being discussed at that time. And sex trafficking wasn't such a subject. You know, there were no NGOs, there were no laws, no nothing. And I went back with my Emmy to the 22 women in prostitution who I'd met in Bombay. And uh, I said, here's the prize, and I told your story. And, uh, you know, so now, you know, the world will do something about it. Uh, and the women said, but, you know, what about us? You can't walk away. Now that you've won the Emmy, can't you help us? And I said, but I don't know how to help you. I'm just a journalist. Uh, I know how to tell the story. But I'm not a doctor, lawyer, social worker, nothing. And uh, so they said that, uh, but you know English. You have influence, networks, uh, power, privilege. Uh, so maybe you can bring that to the table. And I said, yes, I do have that and I would like to bring that to the table. But I said, the struggle is yours. And uh, you know, at one time when I was filming inside the process of Bombay, uh, somebody had pulled out a knife on me and said, I won't let you kill me. And there were about 22 women who had surrounded me and said, Hello? if you kill her, you have to kill us first because we want to tell our story, because we want to save our daughters from the same fate. And so these, uh, I said, remember that you formed a circle around me and saved me. So we have to work together to end this thing. And you, know, you rescued me, I can rescue you, but it has to be a much more participatory and equal thing. And they said, sure. So that is why. At that point, we created an NGO, which is now called, which was called Apne Aap. Apne Aap means self-empowerment in Hindi. And our uh, plan was, because we didn't know how to make a business plan, and it was all the dreams of the women which became the business plan. And so uh, I asked the women, I said, what do you want? And at that time, they had four dreams. The first dream <coughs> was, they said, they said they wanted a school for their children. They said, whatever has happened to us has happened, but we want a different destiny for our daughters. Our daughters should be saved from this. Uh, because very often the brothel manager would just ask the mothers to replace themselves with their daughters. And then the second dream was, they said they wanted a job in an office. And uh, if you can imagine a brothel in Bombay, it's like rickety stairs, full of rats, uh, room after room down long hallways with one toilet after 20 rooms. Uh, iron bars, brothel managers sitting at the door, two or three beds stuffed into four by five feet rooms, divided by saris, no, no ventilation, smelly, dirty, and uh, you know, I, nothing, you know, and I couldn't imagine what they meant when they said a job in an office. And uh, so I said, what does that mean? So they said something where we work fixed hours, nine to five, where nobody beats us and shouts at us, 
where um, you know we have fixed monthly income and old age pension and it's true and I said of course you know the third dream they had was they said they wanted exactly like Virginia Woolf they said we want a room of our own and I said what do you mean by room of your own I was an English liter literature student <laughs> And we said that, uh, you know, where we can sleep for as long as we want to. And one of the stories is exactly about that in this, by Manto, a very famous writer, uh, who died in Pakistan, used to live in Bombay. And uh, he, uh, you know, they said where we can sleep for as long as we want to. And, uh, you know, you know, because in a red light area, a customer can come and demand a woman any time that he wants. It's not up to the woman. And there's a story here where, you know, um, this woman keeps telling the pimp that I want to go to sleep, I want to go to sleep. And he says, no, one more customer is coming, one more, one more. And she can't sleep. So, you know, many of these stories have been selected exactly because they rang true to me, for me, because I, that's what the women were telling me. So that was the third dream that, uh, you know, they wanted a um, room of their own where they could sleep as long as they wanted. Nobody could walk in when they wanted. The children could play safely on the uh, floor because very often the customers would reach out to the children while reaching out for the women. And uh, the fourth dream was justice. And I said, what does justice mean to you? Because it seems so remote from the reality of that room inside Bombay's brothels. And uh, they said, oh, uh, you know, two things. They said that we want those who have broken away our dreams to be punished. And those who bought us and sold us and also protection. They said there was nobody to watch out for us when we ran away from uh, a brothel. Like they said, they went to a police station and the police would return them back. So nobody protected them. Or when they were pulled out of school and put into a brothel, nobody found out why they went missing. So they wanted protection and accountability, people to be punished. So based on that, we create, set up up hired a small classroom in an old municipal school in Bombay. I, the teacher, uh, began to prepare the kids for school who were daughters and sons of uh, women in prostitution. And, uh, uh, you know, slowly the kids were ready to go to school because, uh, you know, we were training them and teaching them and all of that. And uh, then came the time to admit them to school and the women said, but, you know, the principal is objecting. He says, other parents will object. He won't admit daughters of prostitutes. So I said, let's form a group and go together. And they did. And they cried and begged, and the principal relented, obviously, and he said, okay. And then the children did really well, because they were tenacious enough to know this was the only way out of this hell they were living in. And, uh, you know, now there's one in Bard College, another one is an animation artist. Mm. Um, wow. This one accepted mm. to law school in, in Maine. University of Southern Maine, <laughs> yes. Uh, she came for summer school last year. And, uh, you know, so... Fast forward, uh, of the 22 women that I started up with, only one is alive and even she's got AIDS, she lives in Bombay, but her daughter is an animation artist and all the children of those women have done well and they've moved out of the red light areas and they have jobs and careers and also fast forward, what they learned uh, while working in Bombay, we began to then uh, implement in places where the need was the greatest. So we moved to Calcutta, which has the biggest red light area in the world and the worst really really exploitative so Nandaji set up under British colonialism to serve as British soldiers and clerks to provide them disease free women and uh, you know Bihar where it's one of the poorest states uh, in India uh, and the socio uh, the economic indicators for development there are uh, worse than many states in Africa so uh, there's intergenerational prostitution in some of those places where prostitution is passed down among certain caste communities uh, who were labelled as criminal tribes, again under British colonialism, and uh, so cut off from schools and jobs and land and all of that. And they are, you know, they're like the Roma of Europe. They suffer from intergenerational prostitution, where prostitution is passed down from mother to daughter and pimping from uh, father to son. Schools won't admit them, nobody will give them jobs, they're branded almost. So we began working there, Delhi, among such communities, we're about to start in Rajasthan. And again, fast forward, uh, the organization Apne Aap has grown and we've helped more than 20,000 girls and women and their family members. We've perfected the four dreams into, perfected is not the right word because nothing is perfect. You have to be alert enough to do things as the situation requires. 
but at least we figured out a framework for what we do. I call it an approach and not a model, uh, which is that we know that the basic needs are human rights of these girls and women. And uh, what we've managed to do is to connect them to what we call the 10 assets. And the 10 assets are both tangible and intangible. So now we go into a red light area or a slum, which is a caste ghetto suffering from intergenerational prostitution, enroll the women as members and give them an ID card because we realize that having an ID gives them visibility in the eyes of the law, so they're less likely to be exploited. Also, they know they're a member of a network. And that ID card is called an asset card. And in that, we list 10 assets. And through the Apnea program, where we still have the community center, which is easily accessible to the women in the red light area or slum, we make sure the woman and the girl get <coughs> 10 assets. The first is a safe space, which is our community center, where she can come and sit and sing, they can share stories, sing, stitch torn clothes, uh, eat, uh, watch their children being tutored, uh, learn something about how to even write themselves, whatever, fill up forms, all of that. The second is education, which was the first dream that we wanted uh, the children educated. The third asset is, uh, which is very critical, it's uh, self-esteem or self-confidence which we do through in a number of ways, art, dance and yoga because many of the women hate their bodies and the kids because they know they're going to be exploited because of their bodies. And uh, storytelling, so also the ability to teach the women how to speak to the media, speak to society, media interactions. We bring out our own newspaper called Red Light with Dispatch in which uh, the women dictate their narratives to our staff members and they write to each other. And what happens is through the storytelling, the women realize they are not crazy, the system is crazy, because very often the stories are similar. What one woman is talking about in Bihar is the same as a woman talking about in Sonagachi in Calcutta or in Delhi. And she'll tell me that, Didi, you know, this is my life. And so suddenly the shame, fear and guilt that the woman feels, that it's all because of her, she realizes it's not, it's the system. And the fourth uh, asset is um, um, political skills. So we teach the women how to write, you know, fill up forms, but speak to authorities, write slogans, make posters, go out in rallies if need be. The fifth asset is actually to get government IDs. Most of the poor people, and especially if you're poor female and low caste, you're likely not to have any documents. And uh, so you don't have a birth certificate, let alone a voter ID card, or any of the uh, caste certificates or certificates to prove that you're poor so that you can access government services and entitlements. So we help them get these government IDs by filling up forms and then speaking to authorities, sometimes going in groups and campaigning for them. And once that happens, the change begins. Because then what happens is that with that they get linked, then the next thing is linking to government uh, services and subsidies and entitlements. So low cost food, uh, low cost housing, low cost healthcare. Uh, and through that what happens is that their dependence on the brothel system comes down because the expenses go down. And if they are at risk to being prostituted, the expenses go down. So of course the trafficker cannot prey upon them so easily or their family. And then the next is, of course, legal support because there's backlash from all these people who want to still prey upon the woman and use her to make money. And so we teach her how to file a police complaint, escort her to the court to testify in court and all of that. And we've managed to put 66 traffickers in jail over the years. And uh, then bank accounts, so there's less property snatching and they learn something about handling money because they have no idea. They literally have no idea and vocational skills so they can at least begin to subsidize their incomes and then slowly link up with uh, you know, different kinds of livelihood opportunities from running their own tea stores, uh, tea shops and uh, grocery shops, very small, nothing big. And uh, you know, if they haven't been prostituted, they're even getting jobs with security guards, gas station attendants and all of that. Uh, and finally, uh, the tenth asset is friendship circles. So if we organize them in groups of 10, of uh, 10 friends who will always stand by them in times of them being beaten up or abused or whatever, plus the larger Apneyap network of the 20,000 people. And all this has, what it has done is that these women found a voice and they became stronger and they understood the value of campaigning and giving all these assets. So after the 16 December bus rape uh, in India, the Apneyap women marched on the streets in Delhi 
I think it would be good to remove the mask really. So, Apneya women marched on the streets and said prostitution is commercial rape. They went and met leaders of political parties uh, and changed their minds uh, to support the anti rape law. They went and testified to the Commission of Inquiry, which was drafting the law, and actually gave language on trafficking because they had been working on it for a long time to uh, the law ministry, to the standing committee in the home ministry. And, uh, you know, we managed to get trafficking into the cluster of laws uh, on uh, making punishment stricter for all forms of sexual assault in India. And uh, that was because these women had been through these 10 assets. And so, you know, there's been so much progress since I began work on this. And, uh, you know, so I, I want to say that I'm hopeful, but I also want to, you know, share with you that the problem is like a tsunami and uh, you know while i'm talking about these individual lives and individual lives are the most important that's why my story began there uh, the fact is that according to india's central bureau of investigation there are three million prostituted women and girls in india right now of which 1.4 million are children and the other 1.6 million were brought in as children and more are being brought in every day. And this is a CBI figure, so we don't even know what the undocumented, you know, what's not documented, what we don't even know. In uh, globally, we are told 27 million. And this is the United Nations Office for Drugs and Crime figure. Again, uh, this is the tip of the iceberg. But people are talking about trends now globally, and they are saying that uh, this is the third largest crime in the world, illegal crime, after drugs and arms, and probably crossing drugs. Uh, now and it's a billion dollar industry uh, it exists everywhere right in our backyard here in Washington DC in New York a girl can be trafficked right on Brooklyn station there's something called the Minnesota pipeline where blonde blue-eyed girls are brought in from uh, Minnesota to New York uh, because you know there's a demand for that uh, so it's a very demand driven industry like I started by telling you that men wanted younger girls men wanted voluptuous girls virgins fair-skinned girls so same thing here, you know, and uh, so the fact is that it's a very entrenched and organized crime and preying on girls all over the world and uh, it's huge. And one of the drivers of this uh, big crime in America is of course, you know, this culture of masculinity where you know, people want to buy young girls, uh, violence, and be violent with them. In Bombay, I met girls who had cigarette butts stubbed out on them and bottles shoved up their vagina. But in Atlanta, Georgia, I was in a facility um, where there were girls from Washington, D.C. Uh, who were uh, teenagers. And uh, they had the bruises they showed me with knives and uh, you know, scratch marks and glass and all that on their bodies. And they were put into the facility for no fault of their own. Not their johns, not their traffickers, and uh, um, they had children. They were separated from their children. They wanted to meet their kids again. One girl was telling me that she ran away from home here because her stepfather was abusing her, and she said she stood in this street corner and that street corner, and nothing was safe. And uh, you know, there are kids from foster care situations uh, who are um, victims of so much sexual abuse, and you begin to believe that you know. The foster care system itself, there are uh, people who are supposed to care for them, who are abusing them, and, uh, you know, start trafficking and finding a pill for love or whatever. So basically, the are continuous trafficking. And it's not just cross border, it's sometimes inside cities. It's a very, very big problem. And uh, the reason I did this book to wrap up my talk is that one of the frustrations I had was that, uh, you know, as I traveled across the world in this 20 year journey, was that um, I found that we began to not empathize with that girl who I call the last girl. And she exists everywhere. In America, she's poor, female, and a teenager. She's black, or she's Native American. In India, she's low caste. And she is the weakest person I know. She's the most marginalized because she does not take any decision for herself. She cannot decide uh, whether to go to school or stay at home, whether to help with chores or to play, who to marry, when to marry, when even to have a baby, and uh, whether to be prostituted, <coughs> sold into begging, whether her stepfather is going to abuse her, whether she's going to be homeless. She cannot take any decisions for herself. And I call her the last girl. 
And I think that our failure to understand and empathize, or even imagine what the last girl needs, is where we are now there. Because very often I've been meeting people who've been saying that, uh, you know, let's call this person a sex worker. And, you know, it's not work. It's basically what I have seen is the deepest form of exploitation. And, uh, you know, if we accept this as work, uh, you know, we will actually be diluting all the labor struggles all over the world and actually, you know, basically not even understand what exploitation is by sterilizing uh, the language because the language is politics. And uh, the moment we say work, then of course we won't think it's exploitation. That's what we do. And we will fail to address the needs of that last girl. So I did that because of that. And, uh, you know, very often in academic circles, I would come across the fact that, um, so that's why I call the book. Uh, very deliberately, I chose these stories by very, very good writers, like the, in some of India's most famous writers, who have this empathy because by, through fiction sometimes, we can empathize and imagine, and these stories will get under your skin. But I also subtitled subtitle the book, uh, calling it The Prostituted Woman in Indian Fiction, because I wanted us to remember that somebody has done it to her. It's not, prostitution is really absence of choice for that girl. It's not a choice. And so there's a whole context in which all this happens. You know, it's poverty, it's gender, it's caste, it's race, it's class. And so society does it to her. And that's why I said prostituted woman. And of course, the John does it to her by demanding such girls. The traffickers do it to her. So I did that to just change the language to make us maybe think about it. Like, why do we use the word child prostitute? Why don't we say prostituted <coughs> child? There's no such thing as a child prostitute. So things like that. And uh, also in academic circles, I began to come across the word agency. And you know, there's always this gobbledygook and academia where you know they make us move away from the truth sometimes, which is so sad when we should actually be going towards analyzing things. So I wrote in the introduction of my book, wherever I traveled, I came up against the word agency. I was told that some women choose prostitution over marriage, that they find freedom from patriarchal structures and prostitution, that college girls prostitute themselves for the sake of consumerism, to buy shoes, lipstick, bags, clothes, perfume. I was also told that prostitution was a livelihood choice many women make when confronted with sex shop work, domestic servitude, and oppressive marriages. As an activist, organizing girls and women suffering from intergenerational prostitution in red light areas and caste ghettos, the reality I saw was vastly different. I witnessed prostituted women struggle to access even their most basic needs, food, clothing, shelter, and protection from violence. I saw women live and die in debt bondage. I came to know of the huge profits which pimps and brothel keepers make. I saw girls and women chewed up and spit out by the brothel system. I met women in their early 30s who had been thrown out of brothels because they were no longer commercially viable. Customers constantly demanded fresh meat. The average age of a girl pulled into prostitution is between 9 and 13 years old. Ice is used to break her. They are put through a month or so of seasoning, told to call their pimp papa and their brother manager ma or masi, and made to believe that they are repaying the small loans of 5 or 10,000 rupees which their fathers have taken. I saw little agency in their lives. Yet I have heard smart men and smart women too say that prostitution is empowering and not dehumanizing, that it is one livelihood choice among the un other unequal choices available to women. Some even say that it should be defined as work like any other and prostituted women should be called sex workers. I cannot tell whether these men and women are protecting the status quo or just have no faith in anyone's ability to change it. Do they, by accepting prostitution as inevitable, accept women's inequality as inevitable? When they said that women prostitute themselves, did they mean that these women are sex with themselves? Why do they negate the role of men? Perhaps the problem is that they do not want to address the issue of male power and privilege. So, as long as men hold on to power and entitlement, my friends are happy to let women settle for the word agency within deeply exploitative systems, while men with power and privilege can go for total freedom.